Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, on this beautiful afternoon. Boy, it's nice to be uh, out in the summertime, even though it's September. September 13th is the day. So, you know, I've talked about the uh, the moon missions for quite a, quite a while. And you guys are gracious enough to to watch them, to compliment them. And so, you know, it's a subject that fascinates me to death. I have the conversation at least two or three times a week, and I don't look for the conversation. That's the interesting thing. It seems to happen at my smoke lounge a lot. And uh, what's kind of funny is it's the moon hoax conversation in the overall great awakening of conspiracies, which is very dark. You know, all the real dark Epstein stuff, right? The moon is like the wacky mirror house at the carnival compared to like the super duper intense stuff that happens at, you know, a major Six Flags or something. And, you know, I just read an article from uh, probably several years ago, lambasting, casing, Casing was a gentleman who worked for one of the subcontractors that helped put together the Saturn V and all this stuff. Uh, uh, I believe he was a Rockadine guy or something like that. But anyway, he was privy to all the documentation. He was literally told it's a 1 in 10,000 chance this thing could ever do what it's said to have done. Of course, it didn't do it. So he very quickly comes out and spends basically 40 years going after the truth and he knew the truth he was telling everybody it was a lie intelligent people listened to him you know followers grabbed the tail of NASA and just hung on for dear life but Casing dies in 2005 and the Guardian does an article on him and the funny thing was they they tried to make people feel bad for finding Casing's rabbit hole by saying you were a Fox News enthusiast, you were an anti-vaxxer, you're a flat earther. I mean, it was the most pathetic attempt to associate your lucid mind with crazy stuff. Interesting. And this continues, and I think a lot of it is is probably in my opinion, at this point, one of the strategies is just, you know, you tell the press, just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. The more you talk about it, the more we're going to lose because we didn't go. And the amount of scientific proof and capability for the average engineering student to prove that is now categorical, meaning absolute. They can prove we didn't go with basic simulation software today. You know, Bart Sabrell. S-I-B-R-E-E-L S-I-B-R-E-L dot com He has been a champion of the truth and he has had to pay a gigantic price where they have you know, done everything that they can to keep the guy from being employed in any way, shape, or form. Now, of course, this does happen over time anyway. But if you really want to hear a guy talk about it straight, you know, I mean, he says, look, He's, you know, because we're all trying to find that smoking gun way of telling you that it was a hoax such that no one can undo it in your mind. But again, no one is happy that we didn't go, okay? We're not happy. At least, you know, no one in my camp is happy. We wish it was true. We wish that we could go to the moon ourselves and sit in a space station and have a drink, you know, with Dr. Chandra. But it's the first time in world history, in world history, that man has a scientific breakthrough and cannot accomplish it again for 50 years. We go to the moon, 1969 technology with one millionth of the computing powder of the average crappy cell phone from 15 years ago. I would suggest that that is uh, a gross underestimation of the processor power. The technology, although capable of putting someone in low orbit, 
it's it's 200 miles up in 1969. That's what low orbit was, and they said they went 236 to 37 thousand miles up. What's the percentage of 200 uh, from 200 thousand? Let's just put it that way. It's over a thousand times lot further away. Again, my analogy that I want you to remember and repeat to people is if you have an eight foot wall in your house and you divide it into metric because every centimeter translates pretty well to a thousand miles up the ceiling right when the plaster hits the top there that's right where the moon is and if you divide it into centimeters all the way down you get around 237 or so and the beautiful thing about metric is that it's a base 10 system so if a millimeter off, I mean sorry if a centimeter off the ground is 1,000 miles then NASA, as of 1968, had gone about two millimeters off the ground. And I believe in Apollo, uh, was it eight and 10? They went all the way to the ceiling and back safely, negating every single thing that we know about space right now in terms of radiation from the sun, radiation from the Van Allen belts, uh, supposedly all this, you know, 100 million particles slash meteorites that hit the Earth's atmosphere per second or per minute or something like that. I mean, there's supposed to be a bunch of dust out there. Now, some of that could be all crap. But the principle's the same. Getting all the way up there and pulling off maneuvers that, it, that could not be simulated on Earth ever because we don't know exactly what the, the circumstances are, Right. And I'll give you an analogy of, or a like, a likeness in terms of scientific method. Where is there another frontier of space that we are still exploring? A man has done amazing things, and we've proven it. And that is the ocean. The ocean, I think, at its deepest depths, uh, I've always been told about seven, eight miles down, which is just terrifying right i mean that's just imagine if you traveled 60 miles an hour it'd take you eight minutes to get to the bottom of the ocean if you started at the top that's crazy that's amazing if you i mean what is uh 30, feet you know the average distance that the commercial airlines fly that's six miles in the air roughly and if you jumped out of the plane in some spacesuit and you didn't get torn to shreds by going too quickly, it's going to take you a long time to fall back to the surface of Earth, right? So the ocean is gigantic. If you got the surface of that seven-mile point and you just remove all the water and you go down to terminal velocity, it's going to take minutes to hit the ground, hit the mud at the bottom. And so we have penetrated the sea at all levels from a person snorkeling at the top or playing in the, the waves as a surfer but we experiment you know we made little submarines and we made bigger submarines and we made huge submarines we uh, make these little diving vehicles we drop guys down inside you know pressure suits with big thick metal encasing so they don't get crushed to death by the ocean we study the vegetation we study the fish life it's a very slow process but we experiment one little bit at a time to figure out how to do that now this is going to focus on the early part of the space program because I want to recap everyone's mind so that you have sort of the stepping stones of how long man has been thinking about rockets in general and some of the basic te technologies that we use to get to the Saturn V. Then we'll do a little bit of the conspiracy on the top end and talk about all the conspiracies in between. But imagine when man found out that, you know, there's this... Um, I forgot what they call it, but it's a breaking point when you go about 40 feet down into the ocean. The water above your head starts weighing more than you, than any buoyancy that you can generate, and you start getting pushed to the bottom of the ocean. It just gets faster and faster, and then you get crushed by all the water and the pressure. You know, when I first saw steel get utterly crushed in the depth of the ocean, it blew my mind. Uh, to this day, it's still kind of, you know, without air in the center of a chamber, I don't understand why an I-beam would get crushed or bent, because it's definitely more dense than water. But anyhow, 
we have a long history of experimenting and making mistakes and hundreds of thousands of humans over millions of years dying down there and fish and all this other stuff teaching us how it works. And so to sit, suddenly say, because here's, I want you to, I want you to take the ocean's uh, history and its knowledge of being circumvented and d deep dived and flip it the other direction. All right? So we have 200 miles up is all we've done as of Apollo 7. Okay, so that's just a few feet down inside the ocean. And then we have this 237,000 mile, on average, distance to the moon. We got the Van Allen belts we never touched, never experimented with, although supposedly with geostationary orbit, we had. And then we've got past that, we've got the normal radiation from the sun with coronal mass ejections. We have all the debris that's supposedly in space, and not the stuff that we've launched, which is today's problem, but just natural space. And again, imagine someone taking a rock about the size of, the size of a die, six-sided die for Vegas, right? And shoving it through your body at about 35,000 to 100,000 miles per hour. And I want you to imagine what your body would look like after that happened. You'd probably be turned inside out, or you'd have definitely a hole all the way through your body, and you would suddenly start just dying. So let's briefly go through the history of, of sort of rocket technology, because it goes back a really long way. Now, some of history, obviously, is to be questioned in terms of its accuracy, but the earliest use of a propellant in a controlled space like a little tiny firework was in the 1200s about 1230 in china they were using it as uh, an experimental methodology to create fireworks which obviously talks about the gunpowder derivatives that uh, made this possible and again, there's a lot of natural rocks that will um, spark and burn. You take titanium and shave it down into little shavings and then light it on fire. It's, it's quite a little bomb. Takes forever. But it takes about 400 years for this stuff to be turned into weaponry. And that is still in China. 400 years, man. That's a long time. Now, why it took 400 years enter combat is a little strange and I'll tell you why that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense to me I'm not denying any of the history of that but it blows my mind it took so long as a child <laughs> the very first time now again up to 1230 you know serendipitously figuring out that you could put propellant in a cylinder and it creates a you know, bottle rocket looking thing totally understand that but once you fire a bottle rocket and you realize that it, if anybody's in the way of that thing, it could take out your eye, it could put a hole in your body, depending on how big it is, it could rip you to shreds. The propellant coming out of the back is dangerous. I'm sure someone burned themselves several times to figure out, oh my God, you know, that's really hot. Then the idea that you could shoot it across a field and make it land on somebody's head. I figured this out when I was a kid playing with fireworks. The big deal in the Midwest it was that bottle rockets were, were outlawed because they could land on a roof early in their cycle and then the flame could come, still be coming out and you could light the house on fire. Seems to make sense. Uh, and the major rooftop was a shake roof where those little wood slats, you know, very flammable and the more they just sit up there, but they are kind of tree with flame retardant. Ne I've never seen a roof catch on fire in my personal experiences. And I had a cousin that would pretty much try to burn down anything he could get his hands on. So it just baffles me that it took 400 years for people to realize that, hey, we could poke people's eyes out with this. We could, you know, light fires. We could attach bombs to it. Maybe that was the big thing is to trigger the bomb in a last moment thing. But they've been lighting arrows on fire for a really long time to, to pillage villages. And I'm sure that goes back tens of thousands of years. It's very interesting. Now, I'm probably going to brutalize this guy's name. 
But the Russian Konstantin Tsolkovsky, <laughs> I apologize. This dude was a science teacher. By 1902, he published a paper theorizing how liquid rockets could achieve flight. And in this paper, he talked about, you know, uh, you know, rockets taking on this fuel, the speed that a rocket could achieve based on its mass and the velocity of which the propellant would be used up uh, to create any effect. So really sort of the basic principles of rocket en uh, engines in general, right? You have to know, okay, you know, you can't just attach a, a rubber tube to the rocket and feed it its fuel. You're going to have to put it on board which means you're going to have to figure out a way to balance in some sort of cylinder the propellant to go through the rocket engine. So it was a, it was a tremendously exciting time for this whole new frontier of rocketry to balance it out, you know. And again, I'm sure that the solid state stuff that had been going on up to that point did lend itself a little bit of technology, but think about it, just trying to figure out the aperture of which this fuel is going to fall out of an engine, you're going to light it on fire, it's going to bounce against a cone-shaped um, exit point to unify the force, right? You can't just have, a, you know, a, a flamethrower coming out the end. It, that won't create any significant pressure and you can't control it. So they start this process, right? By 1929, the guy had released a paper on multi-stage rockets, theorizing both not only two-stage rockets, but three-stage rockets. Now, now we're cooking, right? It took 400 years to figure out that you could poke someone's eye out with a bottle rocket in China. And in Russia, in less than 20 years, this guy, or a little over, I guess a little over 25 years, he figured out, man, we're going to need potentially one form of rocket to get it going up the first stage, and then we're going to peel that off. I mean, just think about the complexity of a multi-stage rocket. We are not talking about a time with when you can go down to the store and buy, buy an Arduino circuit. We don't have microchips. We don't have, technically, I mean, we're getting close because the V2 rockets started using wires and gyroscopes to figure out things. But it is, for me, it's just phenomenal that they had reached that level of sophistication. And what's kind of funny is, and people forget this all the time, is that Buck Rogers, the series on television, the one in the 1930s, had been building, you know, puppeting models to show how he was traveling through space. And, of course, the 1905, I believe, movie, uh, I think that's the year, 1908 or something like that, the one, the real famous one that um, looks like a multi-stage rocket takes off from Earth, shaped like a bullet. Actually, I guess it's not multi-stage, but it's a bullet that's then sent off and it hits the moon in the eye and then they get off on the moon. Phenomenal how quickly this theory evolved. Like everybody was thinking about it. So then the second dude in the United States named Robert Goddard, by 1926, had launched his first rocket that was a fuel, a liquid based rocket. And so now we're starting to operate on two fronts the Russians are operating and the Americans are following them. And again, let's think about that. Russians have the drop. When you have the drop, it's it's a huge thing. You know, what I always have been taught in business is whoever's number one in a particular sector, number two is an order of magnitude less than number one in most cases. For instance, uh, in the video game industry, you have Activision Blizzard is number one. Their market cap, I don't know what it is today, but last time I looked it all up, it was around $25 billion market cap. And Electronic Arts, which I used to work for, I guess technically I worked for Activision first, but EA, uh, who was number one forever, had a market cap of $7.5 billion when Activision Blizzard was at 25 plus. I, mean, I think it was technically at 26 So that's the difference. It's almost a eh, 4 to 5x difference. So by, by Russia going first, you know, we'll have to see where it's going to go. And of course, we know that Germany took off in an in a exceptional way. Now, before Von Braun really got famous, there was a um, 
German by the name of Hermann Oberth, who was experimenting in Germany with rocketry and ended up contributing to the V-2 rocket. Now, remember, the V-1 rocket is more of a sort of a plain-looking thing with wings, and it wreaked havoc on all of its neighbors in the area, but the V-2, mainly England, but the V-2 was a proper rocket, and it had wires in it, a gyroscope in it, um, they had rigged a timer in it, so they, they couldn't just have, like, modern-day rockets that look down at the ground and say, oh, or they look up at a satellite and say, this is where I am, GPS, now it's time to go down and hit something specific. The V-2 was just arbitrarily flying in, so was the V-1. And so what they did was they just did math. They said, look, this thing travels at approximately X miles per hour. London's that far away. Let's go ahead and just point it in that direction, fly it. And it's got a big conventional warhead on the end, like TNT or whatever. And as soon as the nose cone hits, horrible things occur. And again, it, all it has to do is dislodge a building's foundation, and the building will be the weapon. Not, not necessarily the conventional warhead. So if you could hit a building towards the base, well, here comes a big slab of that building down. And people who are in the building are going to die. People on the ground are going to die. It's just a bad situation, you know. Now, you know, in World War II, we have Werner von Braun, Oberth, and a bunch of other scientists that will go nameless because they did participate. And I'm sure they did amazing things, but they always put it at one head dude. We know that after World War II, there were approximately, and I've heard the number increase by 500 recently, but I've always been told 1,200 Nazis. I recently heard it upgraded to 1,700. The Dulles brothers, the Dulles brothers, who have the Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., they were instrumental in bringing over all of these Nazis and smuggling them into the United States under something called Operation Paperclip. A fair percentage went off to the intelligence agency that was the Skull and Bones CIA, and the other half went over and started working on rocketry. But there was no formal organization until 1958 when NASA was formed, and the catalyst for NASA being formed was Sputnik, went up in uh, October 4, 1957. Sputnik was just a round ball with some antennas off of it and it is beaming down messages to the surface of the earth and the reason why we believe that that's 100 percent real was that it was moving extremely fast and everyone with a ham radio or some type of receiver could get the little blips as it's going across so imagine someone trying to tell you their satellites don't exist it's all balloons and they did do one of the first communication satellite was called a satelloon we'll get into that one minute here because we're getting really close to its timeline but when you have a, a vehicle going across the sky and someone, you know, you're on the phone with your uncle and they're going, yeah, 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 I see it, I see it. And someone in Kansas goes, okay, I'm picking it up now. And someone in California goes, I pick it up now. And it's, it's in the span of, you know, maybe an hour, 30 minutes or whatever. It's not a balloon, folks. It's something being hurled across the continent. Now, again, whether or not we're not going to get into any debates of the shape of the world. For this particular conversation, it is a heliocentric ball. All right. But this moment freaked out the United States in a big way. So we had to rush because we were in a paradox or paradigm debate with the world in that it was socialistic, communistic Russia was saying, hey, everything's better over here. We have better technology. Look, because the whole, the whole debate of communism versus a democracy was which society is more intellectually powerful. And by saying intellectually powerful, scientifically, educationally, what have you, you obviously have a, a nourished, healthy society underneath that layer. It's hard to barf out a team of scientists if everybody's starving to death. It's hard to, you know put together an educational system to create this scientists if you have a flawed system. So to Khrushchev, you know, he's coming over and saying, bye-bye, you know, we're going to walk past you guys. And so when Sputnik went up, it was a big deal. So by 1958, February 1, we put up the Explorer 1 satellite. 
basically did the same thing as Sputnik did, but it did it for the United States of America. And what's interesting is, is um, if you think about looking up on Wikipedia or some satellite, you know, or science page on YouTube about, you know, when was the first communication satellite put up? Well, Sputnik was the first. The information it broadcast was nonsensical and just simply there to prove a point. But it was there and it flew way faster than any jet aircraft we had, you know, pioneered or, th or theorized by 1957. So it was real. So then we start getting into what I think is the absolute foundation of the space agencies. You know, next, the next following year you have NASA's formation. We got to get organized, folks, if we're going to do this. NASA's uh, probably one founding grace is that they invited the world to participate, minus the Russians. Everybody who was a free, democratically elected country could participate, could, if they had the economics and the science to do so. I think the entire thing was about military capabilities, the whole thing. Again, you, you have Titan rockets and Atlas rockets and I think, uh, well, we're going to get into it, but they turn into ICBM units uh, as much as they might have contributed to Skylab or any other space station up there. That's always the sort of cover story of why this rocket was created. Meanwhile, it's being attached to all kinds of military things. So, again, right after the fabled hoax of going to the moon six times to land and several times, uh, like three other times to just orbit, Apollo 11 being the weirdo lie about it having a problem. We got ICBMs really soon. I mean, true intercontinental ballistic missiles. And they technically occurred before, or at least occurred on paper before NASA ever went to the moon. But they wanted these things to be miniaturized, put inside, you know, submarines to be pushed out as a torpedo. And then they obviously naturally go towards the surface. Once they pop out, there's a timer in there that goes, once you hit air, do all these special things to blow off your casing, hit the booster and get going. And of course, they're screaming across the sky at a speed that no weapon at the time could take out easily. But there's a gentleman by the name of Arthur C. Clarke. That in 1945, he had uh, published a paper called Extraterrestrial Relays. Because he was sort of, um, well, he turned into a science fiction writer. But in 45, he was talking about potentially putting a satellite in space at a certain 22,000 miles up and rotating at the same speed of Earth's rotation, such that you could have geostationary satellites that could just be right over your head. And then you could beam stuff up, bounce things off. Now, it's probably important to say at this point, or relative to the conversation, to designate the different type of satellites that were initially put into space. There are satellites called passive satellites and satellites called active satellites. What's the difference? Well, passive satellite is nothing more than a reflector. You hit it with a huge cone of transmissions and a fair amount will bounce off of it and come back down to earth. Now the ionosphere can also perform the exact same function. This is where a lot of folks fall off the satellites exist situation and because some of the first communication satellites were put up with balloons and they still are tested with balloons, the theory is that they don't exist in space. I've said it several times, I've been privy to some pretty top secret satellite technology and I have held the schematics of these things and they look extremely real, okay? For someone to go to this, uh, I guess, role-playing exercise to say that these things don't exist, uh, well, Big Brother is going to use this stuff and already is using this stuff to encapsulate the world into a tyrannical place. And so if you do not think that they exist, you are simply giving away an ace to your opponent in this game, this poker game of life. So I, I implore you not to do that. 
So Arthur C. Clarke works with a couple other guys, and he gets to a point where geostationary is something that we accomplished based on theory. Now, there was an interesting experiment, again, in, it was called Project SCORE. It was in NASA in 1958. It was the first proposed uh, satellite to relay communications. Because they just realized, hey, you know, this would be great, wouldn't it? You don't have wires on the ground that have to be constantly maintained. We can literally just beam it through the sky. And good for us. That's what we have, you know. August 12th, 1960, you've got the Echo 1 goes into space. And it's on a balloon. They call it a, a Sataloon. And this was the first time we ever really built something specifically designed for communications. The Pioneer 1 in 1961 was the first one that actually gets into low orbit and does a relay of communications. So you can see where this technology is building a platform in space. It's first, you got to figure out how to get there. So you got to develop all the liquid rocket technology, and then they're starting to immediately use it for utilitarian purposes. And imagine uh, an Air Force base in, uh, I guess, the East Coast, communicating with an Air Force base and the West Coast, or whatever base of any kind, and they don't have to worry about a nuclear bomb blowing out the center of the Earth, the center of the United States, excuse me. And I want to bring your attention to the invention of the Internet and the protocol TCPIP was an invention that was debuted in, I believe, 69, technically speaking, at least so that the world could see it, which for any of you who are web engineers and you deal with time stamping, you know, 69 is this special time that we have to deal with in the technology. But the reason why TCP IP was invented was that the military said, look, we're flying drums, you know, drive, disc drive drums, or tape drums, excuse me, from one station to another, one base to another. And they're being put in communication centers where they're played back, deciphered. Messages are being written on cards. They took the card and they, they clip it to the edge of their cubicle. Women on roller skates would come by and grab them and then deliver them to the post office and it was literally the initial protocol of a TCP IP packet from to message go with the timestamp on it so a general could send another general a message and it, and they would know that it would get there either top secret delivery which is probably more of a human being carrying a package or non top secret messages back and forth so that was the old way then they put wires between bases and then they realized oh my god if we suffer espionage from a foreign country where they're blowing up all of our wiring stations, then, then you know, no one can talk to Kansas City. But with TCP IP, you had a methodology of wiring everything redundantly all across the continent. And if one wire goes out, it doesn't matter. It's going to wiggle around and find another way to get the packet into Kansas City. It might, you know, the, the wire coming in from Oklahoma might be dead, but the wire coming down from Nebraska is okay. And it will wiggle around until it makes it. And one of the analogies I teach my students to understand TCP IP in a crude manner is I, uh, at the beginning of the class, I find out everybody's name. And I remember a student completely across the, usually it's a giant conference table or a classroom. And I bring a post-it packet with me and I write a post-it to that person from me with a hello message. And then I fold it in half, and I write their name on the outside, and I give it to the first student. I say, look, if this isn't you, if, the, if your name on the outside of this isn't you, then pass it to anyone else in the room. But you can't pass it to anyone who's already had it. And eventually, wiggle, 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 gets to that person, and they get to keep it, open it up, and read inside, and that's how the packet gets to them. So satellite technology was awesome. It got around this entire problem. So we get a few more geo stationary satellites. Uh, the Hughes Aircraft Company did one called CENCOM-2, which launched in July 26, 63. I'm giving you some of this history so you understand there was a lot of foundation before we got to the moon. It wasn't like it just showed up and there's a Saturn V rocket and that's why it's a hoax. Not at all. Not at all. But prior to the CENCOM geostationary satellite, you have this guy, uh, Yuri Gagorian, 
1961 as the first one to leave Earth's surface in a rocket, 1961. That's a big deal, right? They had tried it out on dogs and monkeys first. And ironically, all those animals usually perished on the way up. I think the monkeys came back okay. Some of them didn't, some of them did. The guy named Alan Shepard is the first one that went up for the United States and the Redstone rocket. By 1963, John Glenn goes up and he's our first American dude in space. And then it started turning into like rocket families with certain objectives, you know, certain payloads, payload requirements. And it starts off pushing through a family of rockets uh, called the Delta, the Atlas, uh, Mercury, Gemini, and the Titans. This is all prior to Saturn V. The Titan is supposed to be the big boy, and the Titan is what is now versioned up to get things out to supposedly Mars. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Atlas is in its fifth version. Uh, there's been uh, the Delta still flies. There's 325 successful missions on the Delta. But think about it. While all this is going on, JFK eventually comes out and says, look, we're going to the moon safely within the next 10 years to put a man on the surface and bring him back, right? So that galvanizes the United States to be in a space program, and that is always what needs to happen in a kind of wag-the-dog scenario. You have to get the public behind spending billions and billions of taxpayer dollars to do something extraordinary. But what if JFK had come out and said, um, we are in a rocket war with Russia, and we know that their goal is to put a nuclear bomb on the end of one of these rockets and deliver it to the United States, and if we don't get with it, they're going to be able, they're going to be this predominant country in the world and if communist Russian objectives continue it's like the Borg they just want to take over everyone and convert them to socialism aka total control and you know for those of you who are historians with you know from Strauss to Marxism and all that kind of stuff you know that socialism has always been the wet dream of those that control the world whether they call it communism on top or pure socialism they don't give a crap they don't care. And that's the war we're in now, is that they're coming back to make a final play before everybody wakes up due to the internet. And so what's going on in the 60s is that JFK is saying, look, and you know, who knows what he knew was true and false. I don't think anyone in 61, or by 61 I should say, wanted to fiddle with the moon mission and not make it happen. I think they really wanted to do it. And I think we still should do it. Now, some of the estimated numbers of spending that went on in the NASA organization from 1964 to 73, the technical amount of money they spent was $6.1 billion. In today's money, it's about $42 billion by uh, the year 2018. They managed to rustle up 400,000 employees, roughly, to make the moon mission even attemptable. The Saturn V rocket, well, its on paper cost was $185 million a unit. In today's money, that's about $1.6 billion. So that's expensive, but if you think about it, a B 2 bomber's, I believe, $1 to $2 billion. Uh, so it's about average cost for something massive to occur. The three companies that are solicited to really handle the bulk of assembly and design as Boeing, uh, North American and Douglas. Some of these companies have obviously merged. The Saturn V could lift a payload of 310,000 pounds. Now, obviously, a tremendous amount of that is the fuel. For those of you, like, technical statistical buffs, I thought this was rather interesting. It was 138 feet tall, 33 feet across, and uh, it empty weighed 287,000 pounds. Pretty wild. They said his gross mass was around 5 million pounds. Wow. 
Unbelievable, right? That thing went into the air. That is not a debatable fact. It did go up into the air. It did disappear into probably low orbit. A company named Rocketdyne was hired to develop the boosters to go in the bottom of this thing. Now, you have an interesting thing because you have Russia getting caught in a forgery saying a guy went up didn't go up. You have Russia losing cosmonauts in horrible burn fires, you know, because the rockets crashed. And so, you know, things aren't going completely smoothly. Obviously, we had um, Gus Grissom die on the tarmac, I believe, in Apollo 1, 1965, probably conclusively murdered by cyanide prior to the fire that burned up because the official report on him dying is several inches thick, I think nearly 18 inches thick. Bart Sabrell has had the privilege of not only reading that report, but conversing and having a fairly decent friendship with Gus's wife and son, who's now a commercial pilot. And the official report says that all three gentlemen died of cyanide poisoning, and then there was a fire. They were strapped into their seats. None of them moved as a result of being on fire when they have blast doors because the rocket wasn't going. They're just sitting there running through a, a test, I believe, the day before the launch was supposed to occur. But Gus Grissom came out and said, look, this thing is never going to the moon. It's a lemon. We have rocket technology, but it's low orbit stuff. And he was uh, quoted as calling it a lemon in a press conference within the week of his death. But Rocketdyne starts off with the J-2 rockets and eventually ends up with the F-1 boosters, which have gone through several iterations. What's sort of interesting about this is that in modern day times, Bezos, Jeffrey Bezos, the guy that created Amazon, who's now disgustingly rich, has actually put together a mission to go out and, you know, find the F-1 boosters on the bottom of the ocean. And I think it's interesting He says he found them, and of course we've seen the photographs of it, and they're all in different states of disarray and corrosion and what have you. But immediately NASA said, okay, if you bring those things to the surface, they're immediately our property. You can't keep them. (laughs) It's a very interesting thing to hold a space agency hostage with their own bullshit. And I think there might be a bit of a play with Bezos doing that. Now, their F-1 boosters scattered all over the United States of America. They're in parking lots, they're in museums, they're in all different locations at all different states of being in versions and what have you. According to NASA, of course, all these are disabled, all of these are missing key components, what have you, so you're not able to walk up to it and steal its designs, let's just say. But who would steal the designs? It would only be a country that couldn't go to space, most likely. The Russians are creating this RD series of boosters. And one thing I have to give credit to Russia for, and you'll hear me say this several times, is that the Russians got to the point where they had built a massive rocket. And I mean, it, it, was, it was designed around putting as many boosters in the bottom as, humanly, as, as physically possible, I should say. And that their base went down and expanded to fit more engines at the bottom. And NASA's whole kind of dismissive claim towards why the Russians didn't go to the moon was that, oh, well, we put more F-1 boosters at the bottom and our F-1 boosters are more powerful, blah, blah, blah. Untrue, untrue, untrue. So there's a Netflix special out there called Cosmodrone that you should watch because it shows you the BS around NASA saying that Russia didn't have the booster strength to get to the moon. And that was, and of course they say, oh, you know, they had a big explosion that happened. It was like an explosion on the tarmac or a launch pad of a, of a rocket was hardly a deterrent for doing anything. We had massive numbers of launch pad explosions that were unmanned. Were just, they just immediately explode. We kept going. They had the same thing. They kept going. So for them to bail out was very interesting, and, and they build up for scientific reasons. But 1995, in this documentary, if you just watch it, it's all in Russian, you're going to have to watch some, some, you know, transcribed subtitles. NASA was 
told that these boosters, which were supposed to be destroyed, because the in 1973, after we had finished in 72, supposedly going to the moon a million times safely, Russia cancels their program. I, I believe they did have uh, an explosion towards the end, but come on. Plus, Russia is going out of business. They're running out of money. And that was one of the true objectives of the space program, is to break their bank by getting into a competition that we would visibly win using probably Hollywood. But in this documentary, you're going to see them pull open the doors to this Siberian stash of these boosters. And they are all wrapped up beautifully. And again, they, they were told, the head scientist was told, destroy these. He didn't. He had them shipped to Siberia, put in a warehouse. When they resurrected one of these boosters, I believe here in California... I could be wrong, but I think it was California where they tested it. And there's a video of it being tested in this documentary. They said that the average booster power against the F-1s was 2.1 times faster than the best, or more powerful, I should say, than the best booster NASA had developed by 1995. Now, I'm no historian on rocket boosters or anything like that, but I would imagine that the F-1 booster the Rocketdyne created in 1969 uh, has been versioned several times in the 25 years that preceded or followed, excuse me, its use in the Saturn V rocket. And even with all the improvements that NASA and all of its partners were able to manifest into these engines, they were still less than 50% towards where Russia was in 73 but, of course, we're told this lie that Russia didn't have the booster strength to get there. Or the rocket designed to put enough in the bottom. Lies, 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 lies. So Russia, star- or sorry, America slash NASA starts licensing this technology from Russia. Now, the huge difference between the two rockets was that Russia had mastered the technique of creating what is effectively, for those of you who know cars, a turbo inside their rocket design. So all of the fuel that was unspent falling through all the chambers for combustion was then recaptured and put back through the rocket. So it used more of the fuel than anything NASA had put together, but also the design, I guess it's probably because of the sustained burning. I don't know quite what the, what the thruster, you know, pivotal point is, but it was, it was better. So with all that background, and again, we have face spacewalks uh, from Gemini where the, uh, it's all stop motion animation where the, the astronaut jumping out of the vehicle in low orbit and there's you know, like a glove that goes off into space and his tubes banging around and he's, he's like, he's all animated. He's all, you know, just like King Kong back in the day in the 1930s. He turns his head and looks at the camera and waves. Uh, turning your head is impossible in these suits because that's how you take off the helmet. It wasn't something that was a feature, but the animator took artistic license and made something happen that couldn't happen. Spacewalks. Faked. I think that most of the orbital video that you see from Russia looks horribly fake because Earth down below looks nothing like the Earth we see today. But let's think about it. The Saturn V rocket was lit up beautifully because NASA hired, you know, Hollywood professionals to make this thing look amazing at night. And it launches and it is, and this is what's important for those of you who don't believe that this was a hoax. You know, I'm a hoax person. I believe it wasn't true. I was debriefed by two guys from NASA at a lunch. Totally unintentional, just happened. Then what they told me in 1991, I held for 10 years, not believing a word that they said, but remembering everything that they said, because it was the most bizarre conversation I ever had in my life. I was raised a NASA kid, loved everything NASA. I mean, I had the space shuttle poster, and I used to draw the Saturn V, and I used to work with the old rockets, you know, the A, B, C, D engine rockets you used to build in cardboard. I was very good at that, by the way. And so I was all, I was a huge believer. Then Bart Sabrell, 10 years later, releases the movie A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, which you need to see. If you can, if you can handle parting with uh, 30 bucks, definitely go to sabrell.com. I'm going to put it in the, in the description of this video. But definitely go over and get a copy. He'll sign it for you and send it to you. He uses that as a fair amount of his income, and I think he deserves our funds to do that. 
Uh, I have an interview with him in season three. If you haven't seen it, just go to the website, deepthoughtsradio.com and search on uh, interview and you'll find the, the video in the search field. But he re- reiterates everything that my friend said from NASA. And he got most of his original information from casing. But Bart Sabrell was given a video that is a top secret video that wasn't supposed to be released to the public, which proves that they were using a gel against a window, with uh, which what he now thinks is a um, false picture of the Earth that had been kind of digitally put together, or not digitally, but um, put together inside of, uh, you know, razor blading negatives and putting together high altitude composite shots to create this Earth. But it's proof. You watch the video and you're like, oh my God, yeah, there's a CIA track that comes in while they're talking between the astronauts in Houston and, and this voice goes, talk because they were trying to keep all the communications delayed by four seconds to keep up the illusion they were traveling away from Earth. But the Saturn V launches. It's, it's the trailer of uh, MTV back in 1982. It's amazing. It's an amazing accomplishment of man, bar none, putting a group of astronauts in 200 mile up low orbit to sit there for the entire trip, and then when it's time for them to come down, they come down. But you have a bit of an issue, and we're going to create another couple episodes that are going to go into this in further detail, but one of the listeners sent me a a great video of the animations that were put together for this recent Indian, uh, in the country of India, satellite that was supposed to go to the south pole, I believe, of the, one of the poles of the moon. And of course, they're allowed to say that they go because they have to stay away from all of the missions that we did. Because if anybody landed a rover, which is one reason why they never have put a rover on the moon, it could drive over to all of these supposed landing sites and prove that nothing's there. Which is why that platform that's on Mars, supposedly, lie, has never been tested on the closest body in space. Which is what any logical space organization would do. As I've said several times on the show, if you and I invented a car that ran on orange juice or whatever, or we just have a weird engine that runs on gas but doesn't use much gas, whatever we're doing, first thing we would do is drive it down the street, turn around the stop sign, and come back to the laboratory. Next thing we might do is go to the drugstore. Next thing we might do is go to the city next door, maybe the state next door, then across the United States. We'd prove that the car worked before selling it to the public, right? Not so much with the Mars situation. They go immediately to Mars and immediately succeed. It's a joke. But the elliptical orbit that's supposed to be achieved by this rocket is the most nonsensical thing you've ever seen in your life. And if what's funny is if you use the animations, which I can't show you because they'll, they'll hit me with copyright strikes, which I've already done with previous videos and had to re-edit them and repost them, I probably lost 10,000 views just from copyright strikes where I had to re-edit the video. What they're telling you is is that they're putting a satellite, which is the lunar module, lunar capsule, all that stuff in orbit around Earth. And supposedly this thing then, suddenly, with a fixed amount of speed, right? So the Saturn V blows all of its stages off, and this thing is now in orbit around Earth. If you look at the old animations in the 60s, they blew it. They just created this perfectly circular orbit and then said, magically, it breaks away and goes to the moon. Uh, In fact, I never heard of, I'm sure it was on paper back in the day, but as a child, I was never taught the slingshot theory until science fiction movies started using the slingshot theory. And then all of a sudden it was a part of NASA's daily claim of how they made it to the moon. Now, We know from normal satellites that if you put anything into space, and remember, an orbit is nothing more than an object that has been thrown so far and so fast away from the Earth that by the time it starts trying to fall back to Earth, there's no Earth there, so it just falls around the outer shape of the Earth. Yeah, it makes sense on paper. You know, I have a different theory of gravity that's ether-based and not phenomenon base go see my episodes on gravity to figure that out deepthoughtsradio.com type in gravity it's a couple episodes on it go see all my episodes on ether you'll have a beautiful rebirth of all science in that realm but immediately when the rockets stop pushing this thing 
it's going to immediately start losing its orbital distance from the Earth because as it continues falling, it does lose just a little bit of its orbital diameter from Earth and eventually crashes into the surface of the Earth. Usually it burns up hitting the atmosphere and you see, you've seen that several times on, on the news, right? But what they want you to believe is that they've thrown this thing in a way now again there's two sides of this equation for slingshot theory there's the leaving a body slingshot theory which that's the one part that never will make sense on paper without a different type of rocket and then there's the catch the catch could make sense as long as the body that you were going towards is not moving faster through space than your rocket that's approaching it but the idea is that you come at the moon at a kind of a sideways angle that wouldn't normally hit the moon, but the moon's gravity grabs the vehicle and starts pushing it into this elliptical orbit. First one is really, you know, gets close on one end and goes really far away, and then magically it never loses its bottom arc, so it never hits the moon, but then the outer arc is starting to collapse, and then you can do all kinds of wild things with supposedly getting in stationary orbit or landing or what have you. You see this for the reconnaissance satellites around Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But the problem is your very first exiting strategy makes absolutely no sense on paper whatsoever. Because what does the exiting strategy look like? The exiting strategy means that you are in this perfectly circular orbit around Earth and supposedly, somehow, magically, you have a sudden introduction of force that starts to make that orbit that's perfectly circular around the earth turn into an oval and then supposedly you have this other extra amount of energy that's introduced to pop out of this large elliptical orbit that's initially around earth the amount of power that would be required and von braun mentioned this in his design which he shared with Walt Disney, after he launched Disneyland and he had Tomorrowland, he started putting stuff on TV to really inspire kids to get into this, which is all commendable and amazing. Again, Von Braun is a bad guy because he pioneered the V1 and V2 rockets. Whether or not he truly redeemed himself in the eyes of God by inspiring kids to get into science for the remainder of the majority of his life, at least half of his life, not two-thirds of his life, that's debatable. I really can't weigh in on that myself personally but the reason why his design was completely different is because this elliptical orbit thing is impossible without designing it would be essentially a Saturn V rocket that pushes another Saturn V rocket into space and once you get into that stationary orbit you're gonna have to take the second rocket and push really really hard to get this elliptical thing to start to occur once you reach the sweet spot, you're going to have to have a third engine push it out of that elliptical orbit towards whatever body in space you're trying to go for. No such rocket has ever been invented, ever. There's an animation and a video you can watch that I can't put on this video because I'll get striked, but when Von Braun worked with Walt Disney, they created what looks like, to me, the absolute foundational science that was in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. You have to build a space station in space, which Von Braun theorized as a wheel in space, exactly like you saw in 2001 A Space Odyssey, although it looks a little corny in the 1950s. Then you have to ferry, as Von Braun said, lift a bunch of fuel into space and store it at that space station. Then, you build a different type of ship that is not nothing like the Saturn V with its capsule and any of that kind of stuff, and you launch from that space station directly towards the moon because you have all this fuel. You can just point it and go. Are you going to have to still combat the gravity of Earth? Absolutely. But you could achieve, theoretically, a mission to the moon with his technology. Now, Von Braun is also very famous for stating in, I believe, a 1955 or 56 paper and then reaffirming it later in the 60s that the Saturn V rocket 
the, well, I should say this, not the Saturn V, but whatever rocket was going to take us to the moon would have to be around the size of the Empire State Building to get us there. And of course, they shut that guy up. Uh, the second that we're done with the moon missions, he retires from NASA in 1974. He passed away in 1977. It should be noted that the president of NASA also resigned within a month of landing on the moon. Why would he do that? Okay, you were sitting on top of one of the most, if it's legit, one of the most amazing accomplishments of man, besides learning how to make fire and the wheel, and now you're quitting. And you're quitting, in my opinion, because you don't want to be caught in this scam. You want it to go on with other people being in charge, so by the time anyone's ever caught, you're insignificant. You're just the president who had to inherit a lie, and, and if you got pressed by the public, you could say, look, I knew it was a lie. I couldn't say anything. They were threatening my life, but you, you could see on paper I got out the month after. I wasn't going to have anything to do with this, and of course, he never had to pay that price because the hoax still exists to this day. So Von Braun had it right. I mean, at least that's a legitimate platform to consider. But there's another phenomenon about all space programs that I want you guys to remember, and it's something that you need to almost knee-jerk say to anyone who's trying to guilt trip you for being lucid. The game of space travel and of space programs, other than ones that are probably low-orbit satellites, maybe geocentric, geostationary satellites, etc., is it the second? Well, it's called out of sight, out of mind. What does that mean? Okay. Well, the Saturn V rocket goes up in 1969, in July 19th, I believe. I'm not sure if that's the day we touched, touched the moon, or I think it's the launch day. But it gets out of sight, out of mind. It launches. It launches out of your sight. And it's this unbelievable i mean imagine watching i watched the space shuttle go off when i was probably about 13 years old and it was phenomenal watching that thing take off i mean the engine sounds are unlike anything you've ever heard and i believe those are solid state engines right non-liquid except the central tank right but once it's out of your sight then they can claim anything that they want and one of the real juvenile things that's happening right now and it's an innocent mistake that we're making is that when we see all those NASA guys sitting around their computers, supposedly monitoring this mission, they're looking at computers, computer screens. Okay. They weren't watching a video game, man. They weren't watching animated sprites going across the screen telling them where we were. They were simply looking at numbers on screens, telling them where this thing was. So a lot of people say, well, this was confirmed by Russia. And that's really the only partner that was qualified to confirm it. I've heard, you know, China is thrown in there. It's like China in the 60s was in this technical stone ages. You know, they weren't, they weren't looking up going, oh, yeah, it's totally real. But the way that they faked the moon mission, I have a whole episode on how we faked it. So if you're all bent out of shape, go see the, you know, how, we, how they faked it. It's going to be in the NASA category on the website, deepthoughtsradio.com is that in April of that year, or March or something like that, they put up a satellite in space around Earth that beamed down to NASA Houston all of the data that would be coming down to the Earth if we had gone to the moon. So they could simulate the whole thing, technically, so that when we really do it, we'll have everyone rehearsed. And that's why the three major satellite stations around Earth, they also heard this fake satellite going around beaming down the information. And they interviewed, there's a documentary out there I cannot find anymore, for various reasons, that interviewed the gentleman that worked in the satellite station in Australia. And it was this uh, party they were having to commemorate their contribution to going to the moon. And this documentary filmmaker, and I can't remember if I was hearing Australian voices or British voices. I tend to think it was a British team that came over to interview these folks, but I could be wrong. But on video, on HD 16 by 9 video, the guy proposes, he has them tell them the story. And they're, they're mo most of these guys are really old by now. It's like 60s, 70s, 80s year old guys. And there was one young guy, a younger guy in his probably 60s that was there, I think. Either that or he was much healthier than the other guys. But he asked them, he said, look, you say that we went to the moon because you heard all of the communications just like Sputnik of the 
lunar module going to the moon. And that's what makes you think that we went. And if you had a lie detector test today, you'd say we went. And you wouldn't be a liar on this tape, but you really are not one to have proof. You don't. You weren't on the vehicle. I don't know that Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, or Neil Armstrong ever had a lie detector test. Wouldn't that be interesting? Because Michael's pretty young still. I, it would be interesting, you know, but they would probably rig the whole thing. But anyway, they said to the guy, the guys, hey, look, what if they just put another satellite up in July, unbeknownst to you, launching from somewhere, calling it some communication satellite for some telecom, but it really is just this other satellite, and it just changed the numbers. Or the one that's already up there goes to script number two in the microchips or the rope memory that they said they had, and it beams down different numbers to you guys, slightly different. Couldn't that have forged your readings and given you the impression that we went? And every single guy who spoke after they asked that question went, Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's totally possible. Huh. What do you think about that? You know, and this one guy walks up through a sliding glass door and says, I don't think we should be talking about this. Oh, there's the thought police. There's the deep state police. There's the cover up police. If they went to the moon, that guy would have never uttered those words. Another little smoking gun for your quiver of truth. So that's how they faked all the data down to NASA. But to, to make it even easier for NASA folks to fake it. And again, people always ask me, well, you know, thousands of people participated in this. And I can't believe that they would all be still in on the hoax 50 years later. I don't disagree. I don't think that many people participated in the hoax. I think most people were sitting at a terminal staring at numbers, which could be transmitted locally didn't have to come from outer space they're just telling a program to tell these folks what's going on hmm food for thought right the number one Achilles heel for the space program is the slingshot theory escaping earth it doesn't work it doesn't work and we've just been looking past it the entire time the second thing is just the, sh the sheer statistics of the whole thing as again, I'm borrowing this from Bart Sabrell. So give this dude some props, give him some money however you can, because he's worth it. He has made the point that in 50 years, we haven't recreated this amazing accomplishment of man. We haven't gone back to the moon with superior technology. We can put a rover on Mars every single time, minus 1998, which was a huge lie. But he also has a great analogy in the interview I gave him where he talks about the 747. 747 took over 160 attempts to get it off the ground. We already had planes. We already had aviation all figured out. We had the shape of the wing figured out. We had plenty of jets that were flying. But the 747 took 160 attempts to get it off the ground. It's like 165 or something like that. And it took, I believe, something around 17 years to get the whole thing created. It's just a commercial airline. So you might say, oh, but the NASA had a lot more people working on this other thing. Well, you can't go any faster than the experimentation on the launch pad. The other big statistical anomaly, which makes absolutely no sense, is my analogy I gave you at the beginning of this episode. We'd only been two millimeters off the, off the surface of the ground in terms of relative distance to the moon. And all of a sudden, we go all the way to the ceiling and back over and over and over again even the Apollo 11 or excuse me the Apollo 13 I probably said that wrong in an early episode it has this anomaly on the outside an explosion which even in the official report they never could figure out what exploded on the outside it has less than a paragraph a description on it but hey Apollo 14 no problem we're not going to delay things much we're going to get it back out there again boom why did Apollo 13 have this weird anomaly because society was getting completely bored to death of the moon missions and starting to write in and complain to networks that their favorite television shows were being pulled off the air because of this moon coverage. One of them being I Love Lucy. Wow, that's a cool contribution that Lucy made and she didn't even know about it. So they had to create drama. Now I want to loop back, since we're sort of done with the basics there. The next episode is going to be about 
getting to the moon's surface. And then we're going to do a whole episode about being on the moon's surface and then getting home. Stuff I've covered in the past, but I'm trying to cover it in a lot more detail so that we cover all the bases exhaustively, right? But I did an episode a few back where I talked about Stanley Kubrick participating in this whole thing. And I've had some individuals still have a problem with the fact that The Shining looks conclusively um, calling out to some secret you know, participation in the moon missions. Um, and I shared how I work with Vivian Kubrick for hours and hours. I mean, I don't even know. We would have four or five hour conversations for days and days and days parsing every detail. And, but she was very good about, you know, entertaining the idea that maybe your father was involved with this stuff. And then we started looking at where he was physically in the world and the claims of where he's been in the world to participate in this, meeting with Nixon and all this other stuff, and it simply defies his travel plans and his locations. Now, again, I'm just going to recap a little bit. For those of you who've seen that episode, uh, this will be a repeat for sure, but I think it's important because I'm going to add a little bit more of my own exhaustive research in this, especially with Vivian personally, to drive home the fact that, that the Shining was a, a connection of coincidences, and people hate when I when they've devoted themselves to that theory. And there's videos of me telling you that this is true, and I'm going to leave them up there. But I was wrong. I was so completely wrong. So it is my personal belief, and I, this particular thing I'm talking about is something that I don't think Vivian quite has an opinion about. I think that 2001 A Space Odyssey was an experiment in what technology would be very handy when trying to forge space footage, especially moon footage. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think anything from 2001 participated in the Saturn V launch, any of the um, crazy optics that were done inside the capsule that Bart Sabrell revealed in the top secret video he was given has nothing to do with that. But front projection, um, you know, the Hollywood has been doing overcranking cameras for years to make things look like they have weightlessness, slow motion. But he physically, you know, the only thing that people can lean on at this point is to say, oh, it was all filmed in England, and that's where Kubrick physically was. Kubrick was home with his family the day that they landed on the moon at least put that out on TV, right? And he was very excited about the whole thing. He wasn't, uh, oh, great, my footage is going out there to the whole world sort of thing. But Vivian made one point that I think I might have forgotten to make in the recap of the whole thing in the episode I did last season. And it's, if you respect Kubrick, and if you don't, then all I can say is you know nothing about filmmaking, which I doubt there's too many people out there that don't. She said, look, man, have you seen the moon footage? My father would roll in his grave if, if he thought that that's the footage he left the public to figure out that we went to the moon. It's horrible implementations of the technology. Now, was it good enough to fool a public? Absolutely. So to that, they get an A+, plus, but it ain't Kubrick-level filming. If you watch 2001 A Space Odyssey, there's a special scene when the doctor goes from Earth through the wheel, talks to the scientists from Russia, then goes to the moon, has a debriefing about having found the monolith on the moon, and then they go out to see it. They're eating ham sandwiches and stuff, right? But Kubrick got gravity right in 2001 A Space Odyssey. They weren't floating around on the moon. A 280-pound astronaut, meaning his 180-pound base body with a 100-pound backpack on the back, and that's negating a lot of the weight that was supposedly on these guys. They'd weigh about 48 pounds. And so they're not going to be floating on the moon just because the, Earth, the, gra- the gravity on the moon is different than Earth. It's not going to be that way. And I know that people try to submit these, these equations for, no, no, the rate of gravity is different. You know, so you do float around. It's like, we'll see. We'll see when we get there. I think that his astronauts are, sorry, his space guys walking down the ramp to see the, the monolith is his impression of how that works. And NASA was there as scientists designing all kinds of the 
the space helmets and the suits and all kinds of vehicles, uh, working with Trumbull to figure out how to you know, make things look in space because that's the way they believed it was going to be. But you can't just bring in Hollywood and say, um, now you're going to go work for a top secret program that's going to lie to the world about spending roughly $40 billion. I think Bart Sabrell has a better ledger on that. I think it's about $150 billion in modern money. But the footage on the moon doesn't look like anything Kubrick would approve of or be a part of. And he was, uh, you know, he was very stern about his crew and how they participated in things and what have you. Now, The Shining. Just to go through a quick recap of the things that we think were the telltale signs that he participated or knew something about it or whatever. The, uh, the scene in The Shining that is the, the pivotal scene for anyone getting into this, and again, the Native American art on the wall looked very rockety. I'm from a Indian, Native American part of the world in Kansas, and I can't say that I've ever seen anything like that, but I probably haven't seen everything in the entire world. But Vivian was on the crew, and this is the late 70s, right? So she's in her uh, late teens, She's born in 1960s, so just just take it. You know, in 77, she's 17, 78, she's 18. It's real easy. So she's a very lucid person, and she had been with her father for the majority of her life because of a medical condition. He wouldn't let her out of his sight until she was 12 and a half. She got her first sleepover because at night uh, she could stop breathing, and she had her last incident at the age of nine. So at three years had passed, three and a half years or so had passed, and so he let her spend the night one night. So that peeled off and she was healthy from that point forward. But the scene in The Shining is the little boy playing on the carpet with his little Hot Wheels and a tennis ball rolls up to him. He stands up, walks to room 237, which has the door open and the keys in there. And something bad happens to the kid. And of course, Jack Nicholson goes in there a little later. He finds this hot chick in the bathtub. She turns into this decrepit old lady and it's just this unbelievable Cinema, cinematography scene. I mean, it's it's seriously one of the best filmmaking moments in, in horror movie history, in my opinion. Because Stanley didn't create silly things, right? Stanley created believable things. And he just left a... He's just a genius. I mean, he's just a genius. So, the carpet. The carpet looks like the same hexagonal shape of a launch pad. So, the idea is that that's the launch pad. The kid stands up and he's got an Apollo 11 shirt on which is the launch. It's a metaphorical launch of the rocket. Then he travels down the hallway to room 237. Now, 237,000 miles at the time was the perception of the average distance um, to the moon. Then it says room number on it, and people jostled the letters to, to believe that it actually says moon room. I've always thought that was a pathetic stretch, but whatever. But here's the, here's the real behind the scenes moment because Vivian was there every step of that scene in terms of the asset creation to create the scene in general. She was assigned to finding the carpet. Her father's one objective was go find the most gaudy carpet you can possibly find in London. So she takes off to London, finds a bunch of carpet samples, brings it to her father in the art room, and the art room is full of all kinds of people. Her father looks at all of them and goes, you know, these are okay, but they're not what I'm looking for. And a guy standing right next to them said, oh, well, I'll just bang something out real quick. So under Vivian's eye shot, this guy creates something really, really fast, a hexagonal shape, and then takes it to Stanley in the set. He goes, is this good? And he goes, yeah, great, boom. Not a big debate, not a big, well, you know, I'm thinking more of something like a launch pad shape, right? None of that dialogue occurred. It was very quick, very rapid, and it was rapidly done because her samples didn't satisfy Stanley. Now, if he was looking for a launch pad, why would he have assigned his daughter to go to London to find it and then hold back all production on that particular scene until she came back? If he knew he wanted a hexagonal thing, he just would have whispered, it would have been drawn, and she wouldn't have been assigned to do anything. It wasn't like she went to London brought back samples, and this guy already had the thing finished. It was because that sample group failed that this other guy created the hexagonal shape thing. That's the carpet. The boy standing up with the Apollo 11 shirt on. 
Well, there was a an Italian woman who was a fashion designer who was a family friend, and I believe in a movie prior to The Shining, she was hired on to do costumes. And if you know anything about Stanley with 2001, A Space Odyssey, he's very meticulous about what the costumes are and how they look. But in this particular case, in the room with Vivian in the room, she's like, I'm supposed to make a sweater for the kid it's for it's for copyright reasons that they did this their own thing that way no one can come in and say i own that pattern and so when the guy did the carpet no one owns the pattern it's his it's original movie piece of art right the woman in the room said well i'm not an american what do little boys wear i don't know i'm supposed to make something interesting her boyfriend in the room said well they just went to the moon why don't you just make something moon based right some piece of fanfare that the kid would have worn because he's an American he's proud of going to the moon oh yeah okay starts knitting it while talking to everybody knits the sweater right in front of everyone's face not a huge conspiracy the deep state black suits aren't there NASA's not going you gotta make it out of the Apollo 11 you know none of that crap the sweater was made out of thin air based on a little recommendation from a boyfriend. There goes your conspiracy. For room 237, which is room 217 in the book, there's the old story that Stanley deliberately changed the number to 237 to achieve this average distance to the moon. The way that it really went down, and this was something that was, uh, from what I gather, this is my, my opinion based on the conversations with Vivian, was that this is something that came up more than once in conversation after the fact, and this just bounced around the room with the same truth behind it that is the truth, which is that the hotel called the set and said, okay, well, we have a room 217. You're making a horror movie. We don't know anything about it, but we don't want people being freaked out to go into room 217, so change the number. The mistake that the hotel made was they never provided another number. There is a room 237 at that hotel. So the big conspiracy is, see, that's a lie because there is a room 237 and Stanley knew what he was doing and it's all about this moon conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. She said, look, my dad was a fluent filmmaker. Where it mattered, he poured his heart and soul, watched every you know, you know metaphorical atom move to make sure it was perfect. Uh, for instance, the um, give you an idea of how meticulous he was, the suits that the sort of flight attendants wore, the females, in the trip to the wheel, where the guy's got the pin floating around inside the scene, right? If any of you have watched any of the making of, or you watched the uh, Cinema Tyler series, which I highly recommend if you're a Kubrick fan, the women had to put these ball hats on. They're white balls, amazing looking construction. A very famous guy created these hats, but they had very few of them. And so these women would be dressed up every single day on set in this outfit, and they had to um, keep the hat wrapped up so nothing would spill on them. They had to keep themselves wrapped up from head to toe because they didn't know if they'd ever be on set that particular day. And according to one of the models that turned into one of the flight attendants who spoke about it later in life, she said, look, I would sit there for days and not be in this in any scenes. So I'm dressing up as this character and I have to sit carefully. And one time, you know, someone touched their hat or someone tried to touch their hat and they're like, whoa, whoa, get away from me, man. You know, I'll get in huge trouble. So that's how meticulous this guy could be. However, with The Shining... This number thing came in from the hotel, and Stanley was also known for the opposite treatment of things, which he's just like, yeah, yeah, that's good. Just go with it. Boom. Well, that number on the door was treated exactly that way. Well, what, 217 is not good? I don't know. Make it 237. Whatever. Let's move on. You know, I can't be debating stupid things about the script that won't really matter in the end. No one's going to... There's no numerology around 237 for Stanley. It's just... get change the number whatever so that was a mistake by the hotel in Oregon that was used for the hotel in Colorado so I understand the resistance that that scene is definitely meant to be his participation in the moon mission again I have talked about it at length in previous episodes and previous seasons but as of season four 
I changed my tune. I even did an episode that I pulled down, which was the Kubrick confession video, which I thought was him. Uh, the Kubrick confession video, which has a lot of weirdness about it, falls flat on its face for one very specific reason that Stanley said, oh, sorry, excuse me, the actor that was playing Stanley in that interview said that he was in Washington, D.C. in November of 1968 talking to Nixon, giving him almost no time at all to participate in any type of moon hoax thing. The problem is, Stanley was not in the United States at that time, not even close. He came over in early 68 for um, several weeks earlier in spring, end of winter, early spring, to promote the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, and then he went back home. Why do we know that? Why do we know he never made a trip over? Well, it's because of that condition I told you about. Stanley never let Vivian out of his sight until she was 12 and a half. In fact, there's only one night that she remembers that she woke up and her father was in a meeting once, and, and she didn't know. He, she went to sleep. He's like, okay, now I can go off to this meeting. And she woke up in the middle of the night and said, where's dad? And she freaked out because he wasn't there. She was young. You know, it's just one of those things kids do, right? So if he was in D.C., then, which is what this video claimed in this uh, supposed confession of Kubrick, then so would have Vivian been there. Not the case. She would have been eight years old. So... That's why that falls flat on his face. So hopefully you found this informative. Um, sorry for all the fact dropping at the beginning, but some of you might find that interesting. I just want you to understand that there was something very real going on in the space community. I believe it was all military based. Um, you know, communications are, are a concrete staple of all military maneuvers, right? We know this as for a fact that, you know, when we have a theater of war, you know, units communicating with each other, various base commands and all that stuff, it's, it's critical. So developing a satellite communication technology was huge. And then, unfortunately, missiles that can deliver stuff around the world was huge. I think all of this was a cover story for the military development of this technology for military use. Hey, I do believe, unless somebody from that program in their 80s or 90s or whatever comes up and tells me different they meant to go they really meant to go it just didn't work out that way and so they had to do the next best thing which was fake it and I think that all the way through the mid 60s they caught the Russians faking things and they were like okay if we tell on the Russians then we have to tell on ourselves and so they don't do that now unfortunately if you see my video called NASA for sale this is all for sale Whatever props they've invented for fake space stations, rovers on various bodies, you know, India's doing it now. Um, Israel tried to do it. China's done it, you know, and again, China's is de facto proof that this thing is all fake. I mean, they're, they're releasing pictures of the surface of the moon that even with a telescope, man, you can go, what do you think in China? You've got, in the first mission they went over there, they had ice caps all over the ground because they're filming it in their probably high elevation mountains but the dirt's brown you know it's just pathetic and so we have tremendous amounts of proof that most of the space accomplishments today are just out of sight out of mind theatrics being done in some studio somewhere out in some field somewhere why is this important well it's sort of a non-acidic way to study conspiracies and and the reasons the complex reasons that can be in place to make something occur. Sometimes it's technically could be spun for the greater good of man. Again, I will never deny that if we hadn't done any of this stuff, like Russia never went to the low orbit, we never did, we never faked going to the moon or all the other space things, the space shuttle doing whatever it did when it went up in orbit. My scientific prowess at this stage of my life would be heavily retarded. It would be, I don't even know. A tenth of what I have right now and because they did that I was inspired you know 2001 a space odyssey alone inspired me to get into artificial intelligence how 9000 and there's books on this where other AI gurus got into it because of a fictional movie so when you see cause and effect benefit your country then can be used by military 
they're going to continue doing this for forever. Those who deny the hoax are those who are technically probably huge patriots. For them, it's, a, it's an identity that they usurp. Man went to the moon, therefore I went to the moon. Don't tell me I didn't go to the moon because then it hurts my heart. It makes my country look bad. Some folks probably have come to the grips that it is a hoax, but they're like, geez, America is the best experiment on planet Earth in terms of freedom for them and for me too. And don't do anything to make us look bad. Uh, there are now conspiracies I've seen online where uh, the moon hoax thing is being fueled by the Russians because they want to tear down America's ability to go to space by revealing the hoax and defunding all of our space exploration, thus our military prowess in space, which is why I think that President Trump created Space Force, because now it's outside of a, uh, the pretense of going to the moon. It's strictly military and now we don't have to lie necessarily. I think it's a genius move. And I made an episode a month and a half before he did that, before he announced that, saying that that's exactly what we should do. Okay, cool. So that's the first of at least a three-part series. Uh, I may make it more, but I, don't, I think I've got it pretty divided up in my mind. So we'll have some fun with the next two episodes when they come out. But if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. It's where all the links are. I'm not going to belabor it today. There's two video, two audio, two social media, two ways to donate, and an all remastered season one. So just get in there. There's a search field now. It looks good on mobile. It looks good on your computer. There's a category list in case you just want these kind of videos. You don't want the other ones. Totally understand. But get up there and give it a visit, and uh, hopefully you'll have a good time. But until the next Deep Thoughts, take care of yourself and someone else. And I'll see you in the next episode. Over and out.